That's great. So yeah, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the BA slash event number seven. Thank you very much for, for coming back for, for more. And if you are new to BA slash, uh, welcome again and a quick intro of myself. So I'm Monique Ho. I work at BAE Systems Applied Intelligence as a management consultant. I'm experienced in BA um, business analysis, um, corporate innovation, um, cybersecurity, agile transformations. And outside of work, I really enjoy helping NGOs and open source projects to um, basically grow and upscale themselves um, smartly and also to, to focus on their operational efficiencies. And uh, just to say thank you so much for, for all the um, tough support and, and greetings on my, my recent award. Mm -hmm. I would say your participation actually at BA slash um, drives me forward to, to bring more events to, to you. So, so yeah, so thank you very much for the support and I'll, I'll keep it up. Um, cool. So we also have Alan, another organizer of BA slash. Um, Alan, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Alan. Uh, I've been a BA for probably 20 odd years um, in various uh, industry sectors from automotive, loyalty marketing and uh, insurance. Um, I've worked in both uh, agile and waterfall um, shops um, and I think pretty much uh, uh, I prefer working in that um, agile uh, environment. So uh, yeah, that's me. Cool. That's great. Thank you, Alan. Um, so BA slash we are a community for, for everyone and it's our peer-led content focused group to explore more insights and techniques together regardless of the organizational boundaries. So please spread the word to <coughs> your contacts, tweet us, follow us on, on LinkedIn and on YouTube. So um, BA slash so far we have like 400 signups so that, that's really amazing. Um, group of people. Um, there, there is a survey to uh, to capture your suggestions and the off topics, events, how to grow our community bigger, stronger, more sustainable. So um, thank you for those who have completed it. And Ellen will just put the, the link um, in the, the chat box. And actually, the, the more people that are filling in, I see the trends that the, the ranking of your preferred topics changes slightly. So please do um, let us know and complete the, the survey because that is so important that we plan the events based on your needs and your interests. We had our first ever um, Ask and Solve event last week and we have very, very good discussions on business case writing and user research. So um, kind of a special thank you to, to Tim and, and uh, Helena who helped out at the event and that's that's amazing and please I would encourage you tell Alan or myself how we could help you attend these events because the event series at the moment we apply the uh, the Chatham house rule it means is kind of a trusted platform like comfortable platform for people to exchange views and share knowledge and there's no recording at all and participants wouldn't be naming people or organizations outside of the forum. So if you really want to kind of get to the very in-depth insights of what people are sharing, do join us at the next one. And we are still kind of uh, trialing that out to, to experiment what would be the kind of the, the best format for everyone to join the discussion. So, so yeah, so let us know if you have other thoughts on, on that. And Ellen and I will be doing some kind of quick write-up, kind of summary on what has been discussed. But as I said, it wouldn't be kind of as real as you join the, the actual section to, to hear it kind of firsthand. So yeah, so look out for the, the next one. Just a few housekeeping points. So you will receive the, the slide deck and the recording of this session uh, in a couple of days. So we will sort out these and, and send it to, to you. So don't worry. if like, don't worry about making notes, but of course you're very welcome to, to make notes and, and all these. Um, your line is muted at the moment because we are doing a recording, but feel free to unmute the line at the, the Q&A later. You, are, you can also put your, your questions in the, the chat box because um, Alan will be collating the, the questions and ask 
all, all these at the, the end of the, the section. So yeah, so do, do use that. And last but not least, you are very welcome to, to stay behind for the, the breakout sessions. You can network with other fellows here and maybe to discuss further on the topic. So it's a really great pleasure to, to have Daniel today to talk about digital transformation in central government. It's a topic so close to heart, especially for those who work on government projects, which is like this person, especially, because I think we are all part of our, our society and we want to make government services better for people and we want public money well spent as well. So without further ado, Let's invite Daniel to the virtual stage. Thanks very much, Monique. Just going to share my deck. Excellent, lovely. So hello, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us, especially this late in the day after we've all been at work and I know it's always the end of the week. My name's Daniel. I'm a consultant business analyst. I've worked for myself for a couple of years now, but I've been a BA for about 10, 11 years. I originally did my training back with the Ministry of Defence when I was based there. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about how the civil service works, just very briefly, because you might not have an idea how it all fits together. Um, some good things to sort of get you through working there, some key skills I've developed over the years, which I think are particularly valuable in that environment. Uh, a case study around digital transformation programme and, and how it went, and some of the challenges. And then towards the end, just some sort of little tips about some things that are worth reading up on. I should probably say I've come to this presentation from the point of view of someone like myself as an independent or a consultant who's going into government to go and work there and provide a service to a client, as opposed to being like a you know long-term member of staff. But a lot of it you know is relevant both ways. It's just some of the language is more tailored towards uh, dealing with the government as a client because that's how I essentially work now. So just to kick off with, really get people going. Hopefully the poll should be out there ready. Uh, just a little rundown, really, of these buildings to see if you know what they are. Uh, hopefully some of them you'll recognise, um, but there's six there in total. And I'd be intrigued to know if people have worked in these or, or can name them all. Um, poll should be going soon, I believe. Hopefully everyone will get number three on the top row there. <laughs> we really are in trouble. I haven't got a poll for this, I'm afraid, uh, Daniel, just because the, uh, the question format doesn't work. So I think if people can put their answers in chat for any that they recognise. Uh, and then we'll pass that back to you. Good stuff. I'll, uh, I'll give people just 30 seconds or so to uh, see if they can. Hopefully there should be some. Might be a couple of tricky ones, but hopefully people can get most of them. The relevance behind this, uh, in case you're wondering, is essentially these are all clients I've worked with or for, uh, so I have a good knowledge of them. And then by association, because these are most of the big government departments, uh, I've worked with much more of the smaller ones, more the niche ones. Uh, but these are all the main sort of bodies I've worked with, so like a good, good broad spread of government, really. Um, I think we said we've got some, some people coming in there. Uh, we'll start with the top left then, as we look, top left as I'm looking, uh, number one. Have we got any answers for that? Just trying to... No, it doesn't look like uh, we've got any recognition of that one. Okay, <laughs> that's, not, that's not too much for a worry. That's BEZ, Business, Business Enterprise Industrial Strategy. Uh, used to be BEZ, BEZ keeps changing its names over the years, but, you know, where a lot of the business and the strategy and... Uh, energy and stuff like that is sort of facilitated from, they've been very prevalent with the Brexit negotiations at the moment. I've been doing a lot of work there. They're going through big transformation programs. The middle one on the top row, any takers for that? Is that the Treasury? Oh, no. I'll give people a bit more, 70 Whitehall. Does that help anyone, 70 Whitehall? Any more takers? No, uh, not to worry. Uh, that's the Cabinet Office. So where it all happens, what it's all about, that's the cabinet office, that rather innocuous looking door just there. Uh, I have to ask, but I hope we know the answers. Top right, number three, have we got some takers for that at least? <laughs> I think we can uh, safely assume people know what that is. So I'll, uh... sorry, Alan, you was just on mute. Sorry, I didn't catch what you said. Um, so we are drop down to the bottom left, the bottom row, bottom left. Anyone, any idea what that is? Very influential department, been in the loos a lot the last few months because of a merger with another department. No, we've got enough uh, FCO. Oh yes, well done, whoever said that, FCO is indeed. 
Uh, and it's a really fantastic place to work in terms of a really iconic building, fabulous inside. It really is that sort of old school grandeur, if you like. Uh, middle one, bottom row. Uh, again, another very famous building. There's often lots of news reporters outside. Any uh, takers on where that is? Right on Whitehall. No, that's, no, nothing on that one. That's my old employer, the Ministry of Defence. And then the last one in the bottom right, have we got any takers for that? It's a bit more of an iconic building that people might recognise. Uh, we've got a uh, home office. Yes, well done, whoever got that, so the home office. So essentially, well, just, <laughs> good stuff. So essentially, these are all people I've worked for or still do work with, actually, some of them. Uh, and it's just a little way of saying there's places I've worked rather than put, putting a list up on the screen for you and just sort of get us engaging each other from the off. So a little bit about how government works. I'm sure people got a, you know, a rough idea, but just a couple of things to bear in mind. The, the civil service, who you know, is the government and who support the MPs, uh, is not the public sector. They are two separate entities. It's just worth bearing that in mind when you're in the civil service, that you're, you're a civil servant, not a public sector. Sometimes people can take a little bit of offence and, and the graphic there shows you the sort of difference in numbers. Uh, civil service, subject to the civil service code, essentially it's about you must be impartial. Uh, and support the government of the day. Uh, departments are governed by permanent secretaries and they report to parliament. So although we often see on the telly about ministers or who are in charge, it's the permanent secretaries who are at the top, if you like, in terms of the department and they report to parliament. Uh, the head secretary, cabinet secretary, is the cabinet is the civil service. So at the moment, that is Simon Case, who was Sir John Sidwell for a while. St. Jess in charge of the whole civil service uh, and they set the overall direction in the cabinet office. So it's just a little bit of how, how the civil service hangs together and, and operates, to give it some context. So what's it like working for the civil service? Down the left there, I've got what lots of people have asked me over the years, uh, and is it true? If I'm perfectly honest, I think that can be true of any place you work. I've worked in the private and the public, uh, and I've seen that in all aspects. I, I don't think it's just fair to say that all the government is like that, I guess is what I'm trying to get across. Uh, and for me, the reality of some of the people I've worked with, as you've seen come up on the right, it's really the scale and scope. Um, a lot of clients I work with, the FCO, the MOD, we are truly doing global work. It does have a big impact and you can be part of that. And it's quite nice to tackle some real world problems. You know, you're talking about crime, health, you know, social inequality, you're talking about real life things that impact on people. It can be very, can be very humbling to be involved in that work and make a difference. And at the bottom there, I've put, often you do actually know what you're doing. I get challenged on this quite a lot. But most government places I've worked, there's quite often a defined purpose and a mission, and, and you know what you're working towards, uh, and that feels like you're acting towards something uh, as well. So that's just a little bit of background about civil service, what it is, you know, how it hangs together, and some of my time being spent there. Now I'm going to move on to talking to you about digital transformation itself, uh, what it is, the, the drivers within central government, uh, and focus on a case study. Oh, sorry about that, just need to have a, there we go. So what is digital transformation? Uh, I'll just let you briefly read that yourselves rather than me sort of reading that you off a slide. I'll give you 20 seconds or so to have a read and, and digest that. So this is part of a, uh, a quote from a, from a short, sort of short speech uh, by Douglas Terrier there. That's his chief technology officer. And that's from January this year. And he's quite passionate about digital transformation. Uh, and he gave a, a very short presentation about why he thought it was so important and why businesses need to be aware of it. And I think that encapsulates quite well what it's all about, really. Uh, it's a great quote. And we'll see, I'll dip into bits of that as we move through. Uh, you can find his stuff on YouTube and that. And it's probably one of the less well-known people should we say he's promoting digital transformation but it, he's got a lot to say about it and I guess working where he does it you know it's quite key uh, and prevalent so that's like a you know like a, a view of what it's all about so I think really what I want to get across now is although digital transformation sounds very grand uh, that doesn't necessarily mean everything has to be a great big full scale doing everything it can be like very minor just changing some processes or services in one area and it can be a whole new service can be working with a small team or a bunch of individuals or part of a department, it could be a whole organisation. A lot of the time it can be about just giving some skills uplift. So a lot of work I've done is identifying training needs for people, giving them better software, giving them some training, giving them access to Microsoft Academy, things like that. That's all giving people digital capability to make them more effective in their role. 
Sometimes it can be about saving some money. Sometimes it can cost you an awful lot of money to implement. But really it's about understanding that when we're doing this transformation, the underlying theme, what we're trying to achieve, is about these opportunities where we can digitize and increase our efficiencies. So it's always about looking for that opportunity, maybe a large opportunity, it may be small, but anywhere where you can embrace technology and make a positive impact, that's what we're looking to achieve for transformation. And I think sometimes that can be overlooked. People look for the big win, they look for the massive new system, whole scale way of doing things. And lots of little parts can add up to a very successful whole as well. So uh, we have another question coming up. So aside from the obvious benefits of implementing effective digital services, what do you think is the estimated financial saving each year for the government if they went digital? So the cabinet office did some sums on this. Did they come to the conclusion that we could save 500 million a year by going digital by default? A billion pound a year going digital by default? One and a half billion pound a year? Or could we do even better and go over one and a half billion pound per year by going digital by default? I wonder if people just want to uh, provide some, some of their thoughts there. Here we go. So is this for the, the whole government? Yes. Oh, we got in here. Oh, billion. One more. Excellent. So. Okay. So uh, we can uh, share those results now. Yeah, definitely. So what have people got here? We have got, people think around a billion pounds and then a bit more waiting towards one and a half. And uh, interesting, no one thinks only 500 million. So people feel there's a lot, a lot of money to be saved. So let's have a little look what we can save. Sorry about that. So you're going to try to think we, the cabinet off estimate that could save between 1.7 and 1.8 billion pound each year if all of the civil service and government services adopted more of a digital by default approach. So obviously not a small amount of money, quite a lot of saving there, and that's a very big driver across government. Um, to try and sort of emphasize this and why it's so important, and you know, to make sure people uh, follow this sort of pursuit, if you like, to uh, be more digital. They brought in what they call the government transformation strategy. This came in back in 2017. Uh, it was due to run for three years until March this year, when it was meant to be reviewed, when it was updated or sort of continued. Uh, because of COVID, uh, coronavirus, essentially it's been left as it is. They're going to review it, you know, like next year is my understanding. This strategy is really key. A lot of work I've done over the last few years, it's been about aligning your work and tying it into this. Uh, like always, there's more funding available. Uh, it's easy to get things pushed through if you can show you you're heading towards the cabinet office strategy. And really, although the strategy itself is quite in-depth, you can find it online and read it. Um, you know, these are the four key points about it, really. Um, you know, what they're trying to achieve with it. It's been a big driving force uh, for the last few years behind the scenes. And it's certainly worth having a little, little look at if you're in government and, and understand the thinking and the direction and language uh, and what they're trying to achieve. It's all pretty good, to be honest. It's all quite straightforward. It's nothing groundbreaking. It just pulls it all together and it makes sure that people have got like a coherent and like a uniform view of what they're looking to achieve. So I'm going to talk about a case study now uh, of a, a recent digital transformation program I was involved in. Uh, it's called Digital Office Solutions or DOS is more commonly known. So the client was the government legal department. I was working there for about a year and a half, uh, providing my services to them. So the government legal department for people who aren't aware is the government's lawyers, basically. So anything legal that the government's involved in, these are all the lawyers who support that work. And it's very, very broad ranging. It could be that they, uh, they're laying down what we call statutory instruments, which is right in the law, essentially, in legislation. So the minister stands up in court and says, you're gonna get five years in prison for a knife offence. These are the lawyers who are running that legislation, get it pushed through the houses. Um, they also have to defend the government if they're taken to court, so judicial reviews, public inquiries. They also have to manage big government procurements, things like high speed two and that. So this is all the lawyers from government. So it's a very diverse law firm. It's the easiest way of thinking of it. And because of the number of lawyers there, it's generally accepted as the largest law firm in Europe. Um, so so many thousands of lawyers who are based there. Because it is, I don't know if people have worked in the legal sector, but the legal sector is quite traditional in its approach and its working practices. 
Uh, a lot of it's tied around the courts and how the courts operate in terms of timings uh, and ways of working. And certainly when I was there at the GLD, a lot of their practices were still very manual, still very paper-based. Um, so they'd have these great big case files in their room, four or five foot high case files, and they'd be taken to court in a taxi, doing paperwork, coming back, scanning in, photocopying, writing notes. Um, quite an eye-opener that is still operating like that on such a large scale. And then you had all the associated problems that came with that, all storing all this paper, purchasing it all, managing it all, keeping it off-site, taking it to court, looking after it securely, make sure you could share it and access it. Um, and, you know, this is a large, large law firm, very diverse work. So the project was, was working on it for a good year or more uh, to try and get things in place. And really, the first thing we needed to do was establish the aims. And I'd say with any transformation or any project, really, this is what you really have to nail down. They don't have to be really, you know, long and intense. And you can see there, they're the actual aims from that project. that We, we stuck by them from beginning to end. And, you know, they're quite straightforward. They let people know exactly what's required of them and exactly what the project's looking to achieve. And as you can see, as you read through them, a lot of it was focused around this, um, almost this obsession that they had with large volumes of paperwork. And it couldn't be helped. That's what, you know, the legal practices require. Copies for the defence, copies to be stored. Every time something's updated, the whole file has to be redone and renumbered. Um, and, you know, it generates a lot, a lot of material and has to be kept for so many years. So a lot of it is about how we're we going to reduce all this down. Uh, some of the drivers were around, you know, just trying to work more modern, but also was moving building. So the building we was in had been sold and was moving to a smaller building, quite substantially smaller in terms of floor space. So we had to find a way to stop generating and storing all this material. Because in a new building, we just didn't have the space for it. So that was another big, big driver and gave us a very hard deadline as well. We couldn't really push our boundaries out in terms of the project lines because we had to move on a set date. So these are some of the challenges that we had working for it. The ways of working, like I touched on, were very traditional, and resource intensive. Um, multiple influential external stakeholders, bit of a mouthful. And I know in any project we can say, you know, stakeholders are tricky and have to be managed. What I'd say was the external stakeholders here are things like the courts, are things like judges, are things like attorney general. They're incredibly influential people. And if they don't want something done in a certain way, they don't believe in the direction you're heading, it's very, very, very hard to change that direction. So it's very much about trying to, you know, negotiate, be diplomatic, help these people see the benefits of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, we've got all these different court systems around the country, all what they're called different tiers, which is like the seriousness and appeals and things like that. They all work differently. Very, very hard trying to join all that up. Uh, the actual legal department itself provides many different legal services. So most law firms specialise in a certain aspect of law, maybe commercial, maybe immigration, maybe judicial reviews. Obviously, the government lawyers have to be able to do all that. So in terms of trying to develop a digital solution, understanding the services we provide, it's almost like lots of many law firms in one that you're trying to manage and understand all their different competing needs. Huge caseload variance. Some people did three or four cases a year that went on for years. Others could do hundreds a month. So it's understanding, the, you know, when you're designing capacity, you know, well, okay, who needs what? Is it going to be able to access quickly? Is it large volumes? Things like that. Very large workforce, touched on that. Uh, this number third from the bottom one is very interesting. Like all government organisations, they have to be able to provide a service to everyone across the public. So we can't just say we're going to exclude people who aren't digital, or we're going to exclude people who don't have access to certain services. So that meant, although we wanted to be digital and be able to say to people contacts on the internet, things like that, we still need to be able to provide a way that people who can't engage digitally could still engage with the lawyers. We have to incorporate that into our design and solutions. It's very tricky to do, really. You have to make sure no one's left out. Lots of security constraints, nothing unusual there, particularly when it comes to government. We also have the constraints of the law as well in terms of what can be disclosed, what can't, when you can share stuff, when you can't. And then the very bottom one, and this is, I found one of the harder aspects of it, actually, it's just getting your head around like legal doctrines and legal ways of working. So there's an awful lot in law to be based around at what time a certain document's received. It has to be, you know, received by a certain time or it doesn't count on that day. Depending on what day it's received, depends how many business days you've got to reply and stuff like that. So on the one hand, people think, oh, digital solution, that's great. You know, we can receive information all day long. Actually, that's quite tricky for a law firm to manage because there's times and cutoffs we have to reply to people and say, actually, this doesn't count as being served, so it hasn't been received, so we're not going to respond. 
and things like that. And every department has a different way, different doctrine. Every court has a different setup. So very, very hard trying to understand the factual that in. So a lot, a lot of challenges, to be honest with you, very, very hard to grapple with. So in terms of how, how we approach this to get, you know, get ourselves more digital, if you like. So really the first thing was the, you know, the scope and aims and, and the aims on the slide before. Uh, you know, really, really defining that scope. This was the whole organization. It's a big piece of work. We had to be very, very sort of honest about what we could achieve and couldn't achieve with this very hard deadline that was approaching. Um, next, engage the business, you know, go out across the business, really understand all the different departments and all what they did, but also what would traditionally be called back office as well. Uh, not, not a term I really sort of love. We adopted the term legal professional support, but the people, you know, who aren't the lawyers, that are helping to prepare them case files, the HR teams as well, you know, the IT departments, all these people are keeping this big law machine sort of moving along. It became quite, you know, quite a diverse sort of project. So what we did was we defined all the work into six streams, and I'll show you what they are on the next slide. But essentially, once we had these six streams established, we could start to focus on them in terms of their requirements uh, and the impacts and, the, you know, prioritizing the work within them. Some of them are very big streams of work, some are very small. So we can start working out how we're going to parallel them and then pieces of work. Then really about the outcomes and the benefits. Uh, we had to define these quite early on and we have to be very confident in our assertions about them because it was all, we was never going to be able to do everything. So we had to make sure we had a way that we could prioritise what we did and didn't want to do. And then we had to look at our infrastructure. We're talking about digital transformation. So it's all well and good saying we go out and buy some new solutions, but if our current infrastructure couldn't take it, if it was going to overwhelm us, we need more IT put in, more developers to help, whatever it was, we have to make sure we can bring in what we want to do. And I think that's a good tip I've learned over the years from other people, now I teach myself, is that we can get a bit obsessed with getting something new that's really good and we want to bring it in. But if we're going to bring it into an environment that can't cope with it, or it's going to overwhelm, you know, we're not really going to achieve a lot and have a lot of problems we've got to resolve. And, you know, some organisations, especially in government, kind of very old legacy IT that you've got to try and work with. Um, good old dependencies, um, but why I put dependencies on here, I know we all know about that. We had a lot of legal and sort of policy dependencies, which was very interesting. It ties into my challenge on the bottom on the left there. Um, you know, working out how things have to be delivered in a certain way at a certain time to show they've been received and that. Um, so you have to be very careful what solutions we put in in which order um, to make sure we kept within the legal confines of what we could do. Uh, and then, you know, at the end, the sort of good old business change and implementation, which actually is one of our work streams, which was around helping people adapt. What, what I would say was quite a lot of the workforce was quite resistant to going digital. They'd spent many, many years uh, studying to become lawyers, going through the bar and stuff, uh, and they worked in a certain way. And it's, a lot of people, it's quite hard to convince them of the merits of moving over to more digital ways of working. You know, there are perhaps some good reasons why as well. And you know, it's very hard to convince them. The business change was, was very hard in this project. So the work streams that we're just chatting about. Was a bit of a delay when I move on. There we go. So we broke down our work into six main work streams. We had processes, which was existing processes that we could then uplift or enhance or make digital. So it wasn't about anything new. It was about looking at what we're doing and seeing how we could digitize it and make it better and more effective. Then we looked at our existing systems. What could we do with them that could make them better uh, and make it easier for lawyers to work? Strategic direction, that's around policy uh, and legal you know, requirements. That was one of those trickier areas to manage, but without a doubt, it's the most successful win. And, and I'll come on to that in a minute. We had some proof of concepts, some new things we want to try out. Could we legally do them? Would they work? Would the technology embed? Would it all fit in? New products and solutions, yeah, we bought some new stuff, what was required and then behavioural change. So essentially, once we'd understood our aims, scoped our work, we went around the business, you know, canvassed people's ideas, understood what was needed, pulled the requirements together, it's very unwieldy. So then we broke it down into these six streams and then we could sort of tackle each of them and also work out how we could do our sort of delivery and in parallel stuff like that. So that's how we divided our work up. So these were some of the outcomes that came from, from them pieces of work. So we're looking at processes, what we managed to do was give them like a digital HR file. So I understand this sounds a bit unusual, but they still had all their records in hard copy. And that took up a lot of space. It was hard to access. And they meant they had to keep moving around the security concerns. So we put in place digital HR files for them using some of their existing databases. 
their traveling subsistence, their expenses, that was all done in paper copy. So we just digitized that for them. Nothing flash, made it quite straightforward, quite an easy approach, but it saved a lot of problems and automated pay changes. So they had an HR system that was managing their pay, but if you needed a pay change or you got a promotion or you owed some money or something like that, that all should be done manually. So we just made some changes to allow that all to be done automatically as part of the pay run. So there were some things around the backgrounds that were just helping to get some stuff in place. And this was benefiting all staff. So like those all small processes, all the staff benef benefited from it. So a really good, big win there. Then the existing system, like, like the heart of a law firm, if you like, is their case management system. Um, and there was some, you know, there's on an old version of it. There were some very minor sort of tweaks that were needed that really helped the lawyers. One of them was about where it pulled the case file reference from. It didn't always find the correct reference and the lawyer would have to check it, which can be very frustrating if you're trying to create a case file. And also this case management system, the idea was that at the end of the day, the lawyer could also invoice for all their work to their clients, uh, the time they put into it. Uh, but they had to do it one at a time and that could get very frustrating. So we made some changes so they could do it all at once at the end of the week, do a bulk email of invoices. So it's an existing system, they know how to use it, um, but by making some tweaks, I mean, it can be much more effect effective in their use of it. Uh, strategic direction, this is around electronic service. So service in a legal sense is when somebody puts a claim against the government, they serve on the government their claim. And it could be anything. You could be asking for a judicial review into like a, you know, a planning application. It could be around you're suing the prison because they damaged a CD when you move cell. It can be that extreme. So that's when they serve information on the government that they intend to sue them or seek compensation. So this all used to be done traditionally as in it had come to the building in an envelope by something called DX, which is a legal mail exchange essentially. Uh, and we'd get thousands of these a week. You know, you can imagine the whole country, all the people who've got issues with the government, it mounts up. And these used to come in in hard copy and they had to be received, they had to be stamped, they had to be processed. And one of the reasons for that is because like the legislation and the policies in place from the courts was that you had to receive it in paper. Um, there's very few exceptions when you could do it electronically. So if we had an electronic solution, we needed the legislation updated and we needed to change policy and thinking to allow for it to happen. Uh, then we had some proof of concepts. So we said, well, why don't we try some digital notebooks? Because lawyers carry around legal pads and their pens and they write stuff down, then they get back and have to type it up. So we looked at like these digital notebooks, whereby you can, you know, write on it, it's like an iPad, write on the screen, link straight back up, sends information to the cloud, which you can download back to your system at the office. And to be honest, these weren't very well received. There didn't seem to be a big appetite for it. Uh, people didn't see the value in it. They liked their old traditional notebooks. They were concerned about the information got lost and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, that's a proof of concept. You know, we was trying to give them a new digital tool and it didn't work for the business at the end of the day. And then scan on retrieval. So another big issue that they had was, because they generated so much paperwork, lots of it was stored off site somewhere else in London. And every day they had lorry loads coming back and forth with all these case files that they needed to check. So one option that we looked at was when someone requests a file, rather than the file come back, the file is scanned in off site and then the scan comes through to the lawyer and they can look through that in their desk rather than paperwork going back, backwards and forwards. And there's a lot of appetite for that. And it started, we started to trial it in certain teams and areas. Um, and then that's really an ongoing process long since I left um, because there's so many case files that over time, they'll all eventually be requested and they'll be scanned in. So that's a way of stopping the movement of information. And then new products and solutions. So we went out and bought new stuff that's required. One of the things we needed was some what we call bundling software. So preparing a case file is done in a certain way and it can be sort of quite complicated if you've not done it before. But essentially you need certain documents in a certain order, certain information has to be on each document. And the file builds and builds and builds. And I'm sure we've all seen lawyers walking around with great big case files. So that used to be done pretty manually, to be honest with you. They'd fill out a document, print it off, scan it in and again and again, and build their file manually. Very, very slow way to build a file. Also, if you ever get what they call an insert, which is when you need to add some information in, you have to build the file again or renumber. So it can be a very time consuming process. So this software that we saw and we implemented allowed it all to be done much, much quicker. They put all their information into a central pot and then the bundling software put it all together, annotated it, listed it, packaged it out, it should be, put the court address, all things like that. Made a big difference. Took away that very manual task of people's literally a photocopier all day 
for copying pages. And then a secure file exchange, so a Dropbox. Um, if you've got to send information to the call, people have got to send information to you, they need it done in a secure way. So essentially that's a Dropbox, but a bit more sophisticated for what it allowed people to do. Because the key thing around the Dropbox is if people put information in there, say a defense council, they were putting information back into us, we need to know what time it arrived because the time it arrived is quite key. So if it comes in too late, an automatic message must go back to them straight away to say they've not met the deadline. So it's not just a case of putting stuff in there and leaving it. Also anything in there, we need to make sure we find it and see it straight away. So let's make sure alerts go to the correct teams and stuff like that. So complex to put in, but a very big win because that changed the organization from being somewhere that could only accept paper to somewhere that no longer needed to accept paper because it could be done digitally. Very big change in ways of working. And then last, but just as important, behavioral change. So we did like a, we did a training needs analysis across the organization and identified people's sort of IT needs. And I think as business analysts and project professionals, uh, we get very comfortable around IT. We're all good on like our Microsoft suite, our G suite. We're very used to working remotely and stuff like that. But we forget lots of people have never done that or aren't equally as comfortable doing it. And we found that just by doing a very, small skills uplift across the organization made a big impact. We've got people using products correctly, we encourage them to use things like Teams, we've got them working a little bit remotely, getting a feel for it, making them comfortable, and people could get more out of what was available to them. So there's lots of software and technology available, but people didn't know how to use it. Um, you know, people didn't like to have an extra screen, they didn't have to set up two screens, things like that. And it's just about helping people make the most of what was available. We've got people onto the Microsoft Academy, I don't know if people have ever been on that. I think it's changed name now, actually. Um, but essentially, there's free training from Microsoft and their products, and you can get credited. And if you've got a license for enterprise, if you've got an enterprise license for Microsoft, which government have, um, then you can get that all for free. So lots of people, we encourage them to go on there, you know, learn how to use PowerPoint and Excel properly and stuff like that. And then also, interestingly, about we did a lot of work with third parties. So those people outside of GLD, we were sort of saying to the firms, we are saying to the courts, we're going digital. What do you need from us to make this work? How are we going to send files to you? How are you going to respond back? Because, you know, if you just change too much of what you do internally in government, if the people out there can't engage with you, you've not achieved your aim. You've got to be able to put a service in place that people can engage with and use. So that is really what the different streams were delivering as we went across. So in terms of what that all led to in the end, in terms of benefits, um, so information is available anytime. Now, it sounds a bit like, well, really? But you have to remember there's a situation where everything was in paper, in boxes, in a warehouse. You couldn't get something quickly. You had to arrange for the courier to you. When you come out of court, you have boxes of files you have to do something with. This made it a very different way of working. About 168 tons of paper a year it saved. So, you know, there's the cost of that financially, there's the cost of that in terms of the environment, there's the cost of that in terms of storage, degradation, everything, destruction, huge, huge amount of paper. About a 500 pound alone in post, very expensive DX way of sending documents around, so it saves all that. Service by electronic means, that's really key. I'd say it's one of the biggest wins, to be honest. It allowed them to fully operate as a digital law firm, essentially. People could serve on the government electronically, which could never be done. That's a real big change in how things operate. We saved a whole floor of our building in Holborn from storage. We had a whole floor, literally a whole floor, which is storage. We completely removed the need for that in the new building because we've got everything digitized, we no longer generated new material, we've got people working electronically. Fully remote capability. So people couldn't access files from home. People couldn't prepare files at home using software. They couldn't exchange information securely. So it's very hard for people to do their job effectively from home. And obviously none of us could foresee the pandemic, but this sort of work finished just in time for the pandemic, which is quite interesting because without it, they would have really struggled to be honest with you. Uh, and then like faster payment of expenses and pay and stuff like that, the, the one we touched on earlier for individuals. So across the piece, for me, it's a very good example of what a uh, transformation program is. There was people doing small style things with uplift and skills across the full whole scale organization solutions and products. So that's like a, for me, it's a good case study of digital transformation going from small to large and incorporating everything. So, just going to touch a little bit on now about working as a business analyst, a little bit what clients look for uh, and some of the key skills. So this is like I said earlier, from a point of view, I'm an individual offering my services to, to, you know, to government. They generally look for a formal BA qualification. 
uh, you know, you know who it's done with and stuff, but they're always going to look for that qualification that you've got it. Ideally, they want previous experience, uh, even from the public sector. They're looking for people who've understood the concept around providing a service. They often want you to come in and lead. I know it seems a bit of an odd thing to say, um, but they like the idea of hiring you in. You can run the work, and you know you know how to help what they require. You can help the project managers, and you know have some responsibility there, like a fresh perspective, um, which ties in with the bottom point as well. We learn a lot of techniques, methodology as BAs, and sometimes we need to be a little bit creative in how we apply them to government services. And if you can do that, you can be very successful. Um, I've got like a, I do like a lot of lean work myself on the Six Sigma Green Belt. And when you can apply them techniques to like government work, government services and processes, it can have a very big impact. And it's been able to sort of be that bit more creative and be able to apply it, it can really sort of define you as a BA, uh, particularly some, you know, bigger, bigger departments, more sensitive work. And they always think we've got a very high level of technical proficiency, which I think is fine, do you know what I mean? We should be good on our Microsoft, we should be good on our Google, um, you know, we should know how to sort of work in the modern world and stuff. Um, but they sort of do expect that, so just be aware that they think you're gonna solve all the technical woes. So what I think you need, to, you know, what I do when I go to work somewhere, always do a little bit of research about who the Perm Secretary is, often called the Perm Sec, uh, and who the Minister is for your department. Um, and you know, the sort of structure and the board and how it operates. And what I find interesting about this is, um, when I've worked in the private sector, I've been part of the private sector and stuff, people really do their research. You know, I know people go for you know, uh, an interview at a bank, for example. They really review everything about that bank. They look at the company's house books. They look at who the CEO is. They learn about their Twitter feeds and everything. They prepare themselves. But what I find in government, people don't seem to do that. I think maybe people think, because they know, you know what the Home Office does, you know, maybe they don't need to do the same level of research. But it can make quite a big difference. And knowing, you know, a little bit of who's in charge and what it's all about uh, can help you sort of fit in. And, you know, people think, oh, okay, this person's, you know, professional, they're keen, they want to get involved and stuff. Learn about the mission and the aims. Um, really important. Somewhere like the Home Office. There's so many parts of the Home Office, you really need to know which bit you're in and what it's really all about. Um, sometimes it can be a lot different to what you think. You know, there's these little niche parts of departments. You think, oh, I never knew they did that. Um, so really make sure you get an understanding because that's key to your funding, really is key. Um, and don't be afraid to talk about what BAs are. Something I quite often do when I start with a new government client is I offer to do like a five, 10 minute talk about a business analyst, what I can do and how I can help them. Um, because it's not unusual for people not to have heard of BAs. It's not unusual for people not to have worked on projects. Um, the civil service does have a policy of rotating people, particularly on promotion. And people do lots of roles that they might not have ever been qualified or trained in. Um, so, you know, you may be on a project with someone who's never been a project manager and maybe a BA who's never been a BA. So just bear that in mind. Uh, you know, talk about what you can do, talk about the skills you can offer, how you can help. Uh, you know, just make them confident in what you're providing and, you know, they can rely on you and they can trust you. So if you like, these are what I think are the key skills or what I've found have been most beneficial for me out of all them, all them skills that we learn as BAs. Um, you know, about doing your benefits uh, and then like data utilization, and then also using these in strategic alignment. Now, I know there's lots of other things we have. I'm going to talk a bit more in depth about a couple of these. But for me, as a suite of skills, these are, these are really crucial and key. Because um, if you think about it, you've got to understand what the benefits are. Being able to present information is really crucial. It's about government, we're providing a public service. You've got to understand the user needs. And the users aren't always just the public, it could be other government departments. It's something to bear in mind there. Uh, and you've got to know what the strategy is. You've got to know what the department's trying to achieve. Sometimes it's not as straightforward as you think. So that, for me, you know, that's what I'm trying to do all the time with, with my clients and government particularly. But what I think are particularly important are the benefits and data visualisation. I'm just going to sort of speak a little bit more about them and why I think that's the case and, you know, how they can benefit you. So benefits. I think benefits for me is one of the biggest things in government. Um, that people do grapple with. And I don't just mean BAs, I mean everyone. I think the problem is we get very fixated with that top middle, the, uh, the types, the benefit types. We, we do a lot of return on investment, net present value, looking for some money that can be saved. And it's quite important to bear in mind with government that it's not necessarily about money that's being saved. Government has to provide a service, so it does have to invest money. It might invest at a loss sometime, but it might have to do that to provide the best service to people. So when you're doing your benefits, think much broader than the money you're saving. It's not a problem saving money, it's public money, but it's really crucial to understand what the other benefits can be. 
Um, so as I got down the bottom there, money can be a significant driver sometimes more than a benefit. So bear that in mind. Um, think about ways you can reduce risk, provide a better service, enhance your reputation. They're all good benefits. Um, unless you're really directed to do so, don't necessarily go in there and say, I can save you 10 staff and the headcount. Rather than cut staff, we like to sort of, you know, um, look to increase capacity and redistribute that sort of, you know, resource, you know, rather than keep recruiting people, we can use people more effectively and stuff like that. Remember that your government has to provide to everyone. You don't really want to put a policy in or a digital transformation that's going to cut 20% of the public off. That's not very good regardless of how much money it saves. So think of your benefits very broadly. Get, you know, there is some cost saving, but think what else there is that comes with it. And make sure you always keep your outcomes and your benefits very clearly defined. Um, I sometimes quite see them muddled and then that can really start to impact on the project and what you're trying to deliver. So just sticking with benefits, it's really important to capture the good, as we just said. Um, but you do need to understand the disbenefits or the impacts of your change. And I think this is quite crucial in government. With a more commercially focused organisation, you know, you might say you're going to lose 5% of your, your base, but you'll save 30 million. And they might say, you know what, we can live with that. That's okay. In government, we probably have to have a slightly different approach because of what the impact of that could be. So giving you some idea, say we had a, you know, we could provide 99% efficiency. We can take an existing service, we can give 99% the same service, we're just gonna lose that 1% and we'll save 10 million pounds. That sounds great. Just think we'll lose 1% and we'll save 10 million pounds. So that's all good unless your client happens to be someone who's responsible for people. So if it's a CAA, that's five plane crashes a day. NHS is 5,000 operations, Royal Mail is 30,000 lost letters, or an hour of electricity if, uh, a month for an individual. So the figures are about seven years old now, so I have to caveat that. I did them as part of my Six Sigma Greenbelt. So I'm pretty confident in them, but they're about seven years old. So that's why I've got that little thing at the bottom. And really what I'm trying to get across with this slide, you know, the message I'm putting out there, is that yes, we've got to capture our benefits, but because of the nature of what government do, you do need to understand the impact of the changes you make. So if you're looking for savings, you have to understand what them savings are and how significant they will be. Because it's the right-hand side of this slide that you're putting in front of people to sign off. That's, that's the real message here. You're asking a minister to pay for SANC or sign off on SANC that may have an impact on a significant part of the public. And they need to know what it is. So it's just about understanding that this benefits are quite key in government is what I guess is what I'm really trying to hammer home there. So data visualization, um, I'm sure as BAs we all know, picture paints a thousand words. Um, it's really well received in government, is what I'd say. Quite often you might only have 10 minutes with like a, you know, like a perm sec or a minister. That's not unusual. You might only get that with the CEO, I realize that. Um, so saying on a page is great. People love it. Try and do your context models and visuals. I know we all do a lot of process mapping. I'll try and keep that for the service design and for the technical side of stuff. Putting big process maps in front of quite senior people isn't really what they're looking for. You know, looking for that sank punchy, sank on a page. They've got to make a decision. They've got to be confident in the decision they're making. Find them very good for defining scope. I see a lot of people writing scope down. I always try and draw scope as a picture. I find it much easier. It makes it very clear. And then just at the bottom there, um, it's really good to be able to help you understand your business services, the service that you're providing. Uh, and one of the techniques I use for doing that is the business capability template, which I just want to talk you through. And there's also something called the business model canvas, but Essentially, the techniques that allow you to define how business or a team or a service operates. So I think we should have a poll kicking in there, if I'm right. That is correct. So, <laughs> seamless, look at that. <laughs> there we go. So, I wonder if people have, so have people heard of business capability templates? Let me just see. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it just changed. <laughs> right then. So, what we've got there? Um, so, about half, that's, a, that's quite interesting, actually. Yeah. So, about half have heard of them. Okay. So, that's good. That's maybe a little bit higher than I was expecting, actually. Um, but yes, so that's good. And we'd like another session on it. Yes. Okay. So. <laughs> well, that's one for uh, Monique and I to take away. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, business capability templates, then. Let's have a little look. What they're all about. So, 
this is a business capability template that I pulled together. There are different versions, but essentially they just have boxes laid out in different places. It's up to you how you're comfortable doing it. So the idea of the template is it allows you to capture on a page exactly how a service or a team or a department is operating. And the reason they're very good is it makes you get very, very succinct and very, very clear and only identify the key aspects that are significant to how that service or team operates. And the way that it works is at the top is the activity. So think of that as like your process flow. So what part of the end-to-end -end journey are you on? That's how that's all at the very top there. Um, then down the left, as you look, we've got the people. So as it says, the major teams and roles, internal and external, that's very important. At the very bottom there, we've got our systems in blue. So the key systems that are used, key processes that make up the work stream. So you're not mapping them there, but you're listing them. Uh, the business services, i.e. what it provides to the customer institution and the business capabilities, i.e. It's what skills or capabilities that team has. And the idea is you fill in all these sort of dark circled boxes with all the information. And at the bottom in red, you've got the outputs. So what is a very good is, if you're doing a restructure, if you're trying to understand about bringing in a new service, you do these templates for each team as part of that process or for each department, depending on what you're working with. And what it allows you to do is build a picture of your organization, literally a picture. Uh, and then you can start to understand if there's any dependencies. You can also see any duplication. You can see overlap. You can see where there's handoffs. You can see where you've got skills that you didn't know about. You know, like a very quick example, we did one of these in a, a, one of the accountancy areas, one of the finance teams, had loads of people who's qualified to do audits and was paying for auditors to come in and yet we had internal auditors and things like that. So there's different ways that these, these templates can be used. What I do is I pull them together, sit down with like the managers and the directors and stuff and say, you know, this is what's operating underneath you. Sometimes they'll get caught out. They're like, oh, right, okay, I didn't realise that. Um, but by putting these together, you can build a picture of how your business operates. And then you can identify any changes you want to make. You can identify where there's a need. So if you didn't have any systems, for example, in an area, you must actually, there's an opportunity there to, to digitize. You can bring in a new system, a new capability, and help with how this all operates. And you can put all these together as well. They're a very, very good tool. They're very, very useful because they really make you focus. Because if you wrote all this in Word or something, for example, you'd be doing a lot of writing, capturing all this. But this one page really makes you nail it. The other, play, the other time that these are incredibly useful is when you're working with suppliers, either on a tender or sort of supplying a service or even competitive dialogue if you do that. So these are really, really useful because it allows you to go out to your supplier, you can say to them, this is how the organization's operating. This is how this team is operating. What can your products, what can you do to help us with this? What difference will you make? What will be the impacts? And it's a way of having a discussion about how things work. If you've never worked, think of your supplier. You go to different people all the time. Your aim is to get up to speed as quick as you can so you can see if you can help that client. So if your client's providing you a capability template about how the organization works, straight away you can start making, you know, making an impact, helping them and understanding what you can do. So these templates are good. I use them quite a lot. Um, I always find them very well received. Don't get me wrong, they take a little while to pull together. You don't sort of, you know, do it overnight and stuff, um, but they're very well received and they're very useful. The only reason I can't put one up now to show you is because I can't share some of the information from different clients to show you these. The only ones I did have were from, I did some work in the higher education sector um, and people may, you know, it's just about higher education and stuff. So, you know, it's not really anything to see there, but these are really worthwhile sort of learning about and doing them. Uh, I remember touching on them in my BCS training and not seeing them for a while. And then I sort of went and relearned them myself and I found them really useful. So yeah, the capability template, I definitely would recommend bring them in. Just moving on. So last bit little bit, just the last couple of slides. Uh, building your knowledge, you know, some key things I think it's worth having a little read about, nothing too in depth, just have a little look on the internet, read some information. Uh, when you're working within government, just to help you get a bit of a feel for what's going on, mainly in the digital spaces. So the HM Treasury Green Book, some people may have heard of this. Um, the green book, the green book. Essentially, it's a guide about investment appraisals. So it's written by the treasury and it's about, if someone's putting a business case together, the sort of things they're looking for to say whether they would or wouldn't approve it. So it has, it has like templates in there, it has business cases in there and all sorts. Um, and it's not a case if you have to follow it verbatim. You know, people are starting to come away from it now. It's quite intense. But particularly in high value projects, it's 
always worth understanding the green book, what it's looking for, and writing your business case in line with that. As a little subset of that, you've also got the HM Treasury Blue Book, which is about developing your business case. Um, so, but, you know, they're freely available. You can go and look at them. And it's just a way how government on their business case is written, should we say. So having an understanding of that and bringing it into your work won't do you any harm at all. And then in the digital space as well, the GDS, Government Digital Services, uh, they have their service standards for working digitally. Um, they publish them. They're well worth having a read of. Uh, to be honest with you, GDS, you know, they're very transparent. They publish all their stuff. It's all very good, actually. It's all worth having a look of. But I'd certainly focus on digital service standards and how they think people should operate digitally as well. So there's definitely some things there worth having a little read on. And then also the Government Infrastructure and Projects Authority, the IPA. So not many people have heard of these, even people in government, but they're actually a very, very useful body. Um, and they help out with particularly large scale or complex projects. That doesn't mean you have to be a large scale or complex projects to ask for their help. Um, they're there to help you, they provide best practice, ways to navigate through the life cycle in government. They're just a good knowledge base. Uh, and lots of people forget about that they're there and are available. And obviously, because they tell you how the government want it done, if you go and talk to them, you'll see your stuff progress a bit smoothly. Digital marketplace. So digital marketplace is something that's been set up. And the idea is, because government has so many contracts and are of such high value, lots and lots of people want to tender for these. And it can get a little bit overwhelming and it has to be seen to be a fair process. So the marketplace is where people provide their services. You can go there as an individual, you can go there as an organization. You can offer a service or you can offer a key deliverable as in your builder database, for example. So the idea is if you're looking for something in government, you go to the digital marketplace and that's where you look for them skills. It's meant to prevent you going out to lots of suppliers and spending lots of money on procurements. The idea is all that's been done already for you and you go and look in the digital marketplace. So maybe you find yourself working on a project, you need to get something done, you need to go and look for it in the digital marketplace. As an individual or as a company, you can go in there as well and provide your services and be part of it. You have to go for like a process every year where they see you're suitable to be on there. But essentially a digital marketplace, you hear a lot of people talk about it and G Cloud as well, which is more of the infrastructure and the cloud side of it. But digital marketplace, it's just worth knowing what it is. You'll hear it come up. And then last but not least, Good old Agile and Prince 2 or, or Waterfall. I'd say, sadly, you need to know both of these <laughs> in government. Um, as much as government really wants to be agile and really wants to go that way, the reality is lots of parts of government operate in this sort of strange hybrid, really. They're trying to be agile. They want to move fast. They want to, ideas to fail. They want to sort of do a thrift development. But the reality is you find yourself all of a sudden doing that and then hitting a stage gate because they want to see how much money you've spent and they want to see a project plan. Uh, and they want to know if there's going to be a board report and things like that. So just be aware that you may go somewhere that says they're working agile and they're probably not working in a true agile way, way that you're used to or maybe done elsewhere. And you'll find this strange hybrid of agile, and waterfall, and, you know, like Prince 2 doctrines all combining together. So if you're comfortable about, with how both work, you'll find it just a bit more easy to ease into that project style. You get some very unusual life cycles, should we say, like a, a combination of both. And it, just bear that in mind, you know, rather than sort of being the person who says, this is an agile, just sort of say, oh, okay, so we've got some agile principles here and we're blending it with some, okay, that's fine, you know, just with the person who goes with it, uh, you know, and, and keeps it running smoothly and, and delivers at the end. So just to recap, really, um, digital transformation, it can be large or small, incorporate sorts of things. It's like ongoing activity to increase efficiencies in our processes by adoption of new technologies. Government can be a very interesting place to work, can be a very complex place to work, can be very rewarding. We have some quite iconic places and some quite interesting projects. So don't necessarily you know, discredit it too early on. Really understand your benefits and disbenefits, give them equal value, go understand the impact of what you're doing. Uh, you know, good visualization of data and information, always well received, always very impactive. The business capability templates, we touched on them. I'm, I'm, I'm a big advocate of them. I think they're really useful. They're worth, you know, learning up on and sort of understanding how the best, best to use them. And then them last couple of slides, we just touched on about things that are worth sort of reading up on, you know, just some little bits you could read up on if you're going into government and projects, just to understand some of the key aspects and things you'll hear. So really, thanks ever so much for your time. Um, I really do appreciate it. 
Um, you know, very happy if anyone's got any questions, take some questions. Uh, likewise, also, if you want to get in contact with me, uh, LinkedIn or whatever, drop me a message. I'm always happy to talk to you, connect, whatever else. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much for your time. And then we'll see if there's any questions being collated along the way. So thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I think you probably answered the first one from Manoj, um, which is about the basic software and platforms that you, uh, you used in the, uh, the use case that you uh, gave us. <clears throat> I think that was pretty much uh, the Microsoft suite of products, wasn't it? Yeah, you just chopped out there. Yeah, so yeah, we used, um, I think you're talking about the case study, is that correct? And the software that we used, is that what yeah. you asked? Yeah, so in terms of the uplift, it's about people getting used to the Microsoft suite. I know it sounds really, you know, unusual to use it all the time, but people weren't happy using it. In terms of the um, products we implemented, um, the bundling one was a bit of a bespoke development from a company for us. Uh, and then the Dropbox that we put in was, oh, escapes me at present, it's the one that CPS and the police use as well. I'll find out, I'll drop it in the comments. I, just, I wrote a note of it as well, because I guess someone would ask that. Um, but yeah, they were they were COPS products, essentially. Um, the big thing I think maybe I didn't touch on in that is we really wanted to avoid bespoken if we could. Um, so that's why, we, that's why we sort of went for COPS products uh, in terms of the case study. And the, uh, the other question was, and it's quite an involved one, um, it was basically in the case study, how was the funding agreed and allocated for the work? Was it all agreed upfront or iteratively? No, it was, it was agreed as we went along. Actually, it increased as we went along as well. So what happened initially was we had a big driver that we was moving, uh, was moving location. And the move, if you like, was allocated X amount of pounds to move the building and everyone and get us working in our new place. So initially, a lot of that money got sucked up on, you know, with the new physical building and you know, the costs for that. And some of it was allocated to trying to make a, a digital office. And that's where the title comes from, digital office. So that in the new building, we wouldn't need as much storage. So initially, a proportion of money was put aside. And that money really gave us, if I'm honest with you, our discovery. It allowed, enabled us to go off and do a really good discovery report in quite a quick time. At the end of our discovery, we sort of said to them, you need to give us a lot more money because this is where we're going. And these are the products you need to make this work. And this is the opportunity that's there for the taking. You can completely revolutionize how you practice law, essentially. Um, so... Then we sort of got more funding and they said, oh, okay, well, what products do you want? We said, well, we think you need a Dropbox, we think you need digital bundling, this is what they cost. You know, we think you need to do some training for your staff, you need to get a trainer in, this is what it costs. Um, and then some of the costs we could absorb internally, you know, we had our own training part department. So another, uh, myself and my colleague also did some of the training, so some of that we could incorporate. And some of it's a case of drawing down more funds. But yeah, essentially overall, is a, is a chunk of what was put aside for the move and then we requested more. Really, the, the first bit was just the discovery was what we were funded to do. Uh, and I guess it was a successful discovery because, you know, to go fund to move it on. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, was there any more questions or was that it? Because that's good. I actually do. Do you have some? So I'm just happy my might be hatch on. And it's, it's really interesting when you show the... Uh, challenge approach slide and you managed uh, you, you said um, there were six work streams um, that was kind of broken down I wonder kind of how how many BAs or how big was the team when working on this so the discovery part which is where we set up the streams and you know defined all the work and did the requirements as myself as the BA with one other person um, and like a like a, like a project manager at that time as well. And we had sort of intermittent support from other people in the team, like the behavioral change people and stuff like that. But full time, it is three of us on it doing the discovery to do all the requirements, do all the streams and stuff. Um, yeah, it's quite a big undertaking, I'm not going to lie. It, you know, it, it would have been helpful to have had more people on it full time. Um, but I think we got to quite a good place regardless. But when the project started to go into implementation, then it, it scaled up. Yeah, we had our IT professionals come in. We had the internal department giving us their developers and stuff like that. We had some lawyers who started to be not embedded with us, but they formed like a, 
not like a project board, like an advisory board, if you like. We could go to them regularly and they represented all the different sort of disciplines of the law that were there. So we could, rather than going back to departments, we could go back to these individuals and, and by proxy, they could sign off on stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then overall, the SRO was appointed at that time, was the director of operations. Um, so, and we, and there was like a joint responsibility with him and the, um, like the lead lawyer. So, you know, the both sides were balanced. So it went from being quite a small team really, um, to be you know, a much bigger team, um, you know, to get it all delivered and done. Wow. So that's kind of three full time for yeah. st from step one to step eight. For the discovery piece. Oh, yeah. um, but, and then, yeah, there's three full time all the way through. And then once we got the discovery and more funding, uh, more people started to join in. And yeah. it all depends. So some of the streams, like some of the process stuff, yeah. I just managed to do them myself, you know, managed to do myself. Some of the other stuff, you know, like the technical products, we had like, you know, technical leads, we had enterprise architectures, you know what I mean? We had developers in there, we had suppliers giving us their people. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's much bigger work stream for more people. I mean. Yeah. But how much time did that take, the, the dis discovery work? So the discovery was about, I'm trying to think, I got there in uh, March. Discovery was about four months. Four months. Oh, okay, well, okay. Um, which wasn't too bad because it, it was, it was the externals that made it harder, getting around the courts and stuff like that, you know, that added in extra time and stuff. Um, so that made it, you know, just drew it out a bit longer. And the other thing as well, which I probably should have said actually that, because it's a government legal department, it was very, very reactive to anything that's in the news. So your work could change quite substantially in a day or two. Um, you know, the focus of what you're working on, funding that was available, it could be very up and down because it was a very reactive department to what was going on, you know, politically at the time. Um, so that sort of could make it sort of quite um, like quite a bumpy road <laughs> when you're trying to do your sort of planning and sort of stuff out. So it wouldn't be unusual that the people allocated to you got taken away to do some work that was, you know, much more you know, advising the government or saying or draft legislation or whatever it was. But that meant that your, your timelines were slipping quite often and he's always working really hard to pull them timelines back into check, back into check all the time. Uh, yeah, very, well, I've worked in lots of departments that would be deemed very reactive. For example, the MOD, the Home Office, FCO and places like that. I have to say that being at GLD, it literally changed in a day, you know, because the lawyers were responsible for there and then, so could be on the news and you'd be like, oh, tomorrow's gonna to be a fun day. Um, and it'll change that quick. It's quite interesting really in that regards. Mm, that's good. Daniel, we've got another question. In, in terms of your infographics, um, do you have a preferred uh, application for uh, creating them? So I, I do a lot of drawing in um, PowerPoint and Visio, uh, Visio. Uh, and I also use something called Visme, V-I-S-M-E. I don't know if people have heard of that, Visme. That's very good for giving you ideas about how to present information and infographics, it gives you some templates. What it also helpfully does is it gives you some um, color guides because what I've, um, you know, with accessibility and things like that, you have to be very careful about colours you use and overlay them, if they're too bright, too dull, uh, and things like that. So Visme is very good for helping you uh, find different ways of presenting information. And also, I don't know if people use it, but I often get asked a lot where my icons come from. I use Noun Project. So Noun Project's very, very good. A lot of that is copyright free. Um, so, and it's free to use as well. There's also a paid version of it. So Noun Project's very good for getting icons and stuff like that and images. Um, so yeah, I'll get, I'll get it from a variety of places. Yeah, I think um, for me, in terms of putting one pages together, uh, information is beautiful. Um, it's a, a brilliant uh, website. There's a couple of books that go with it as well. And there's just a whole bunch of infographics in there. Yeah, well, I highly recommend it if you're interested in that kind of uh, data visualization. I should look that up. Information is beautiful. Yeah, I think uh, I think sometimes people, you know, it's, as we all know as PAs, it's getting the same kind of page is very hard. It takes longer than writing out five pages. Uh, and sometimes I think we put a page in front of people and they think, oh, you know, that could have took long. They don't know how it, <laughs> it's taken ages to pull it together and the exactness of it and make sure it's all correct and stuff. Um, but yeah, it can have such an impact. You know, the difference of putting like a one page in front of someone compared to like a big long report. Um, it, you know, can really, you know, it can make a big difference. And I think also that's a good reflection on the BA because if you can condense all that key information and display it clearly on a page and someone can understand it, 
then you really do understand the problem and you really do understand the business and you're showing them that with the way you're presenting it back. Um, so I think it, you know, it's a good reflection on the individual's skills as well, really. Yeah, I think um, you know, it's absolutely part of our remit to help people understand what we're trying to show them. Uh, and I think you know, people should not be too hung up on you know, the convention and uh, well, you know, whether it's a use case, whether it's some other sequence diagram or, or whatever, just think about what you're trying to portray who your audience is and, and how they are going to digest the information that you have. Yeah, no, most definitely. Most definitely. It's, um, whenever I'm sort of working with junior BAs or mentoring and stuff like that, I always really work with them on how they can present information, you know, like graphically better, really. Um, so, yeah, no, it's very, very key. I, I, you know, I, I try and do all my work that way. You know, I do a scope diagram and context models you know, and stuff like that. People are writing papers, I try and put it all, you know, together visually. I find it helps me as well, understand it more, if I'm honest. Um, so yeah, definitely. Cool. Do we have maybe, maybe final question before we wrap up? I actually have one. <laughs> Go on then. <laughs> That's for me. That was well teed up. Can I ask another question, please, Daniel? <laughs> it's, I remember it's the, it was the same slide. You mentioned that um, we can't, or I think our best practice is we don't exclude people who don't have access to have the digital channels and all these. So if you, you could have, have a very summarized version on how did you design kind of having the, the paper um, stuff get into the, the workflow as well? So essentially what we had to do with that, because it wasn't, it's interesting, it wasn't a high proportion, but it was a high proportion in one area. So what it mainly was, was people who were um, within the criminal justice sphere, so people in prison essentially, um, they're not allowed access to the internet, or well, not ready access anyway, into computers and stuff. But they might have had quite a lot of claims, do you know what I mean? They might have been uh, you know, appealing a sentence, they might be appealing, saying they've got damage, they might be saying they got assaulted by a guard. Essentially, all of that goes to the Home Secretary. So, you know, they, that's the Home Secretary that you're sort of uh, finding. Um, so because of that, they're given paper and pens in prison to write their claims on, and that's how they come in. So that's why we still needed it to be in place. So it's only for one, you know, there's a couple of key areas that manage a lot more of this than others. Really, what we had to do was we had to make sure that the process stood as it was, so nothing changed. You know, people could still do their claims in that way. Then when it came into the system, is about how we could um, essentially digitize it. So it's about introducing a new internal service really, rather than an external one. That, that information would come in, they would then digitize it, get it on the case management system. Then once that is the case, it could be managed digitally because once we've received it, what they call receiving service, we can then manage it how we like. But it's just, it has to be allowed to come in in any way from a member of the public. You or I, you know, anyone in this call, anyone in the country could do a judicial review. It's not, you know, it's quite a straightforward process. Uh, you could write it on a, on a notebook and send it in. Um, so it's, you have to have that capability there. And particularly with saying legal, uh, it's very important that people aren't excluded from access to justice, really, like a really key thing. Uh, and it's like where I am now in HSX. You know, we really want to be digital. We want everything to be remote, you know, particularly COVID times. We want people to be able to access, you know, everything they need. But there's an awful lot of people out there who don't have access to digital means or don't use them or aren't confident or comfortable using them. Um, so you do have to always factor them in. Um, it's almost like you get a little sub project within your main project. And I think that's why it goes back to my disk benefits and stuff as well. It'd be really easy to say, you know, we get 100,000 cases a year and 2,000 coming on a piece of paper. So we're not going to worry about them. Mm. You can't say that, do you know what I mean? Yeah. People have a right to be able to engage legally go through the justice system. Um, you have to be able to include them people. So mm. you need to be able to sort of factor that into your costs. Yeah. Um, the cost there was we needed to develop a new internal service, so essentially a new team <laughs> to uh, you know to to manage that. Um, but yeah, that was is it's, it's not a problem. It's, um, mm -hmm. That's why I quite like the challenges in government because you have to incorporate all of that you to make sure no one's left out. If you like, it's mm -hmm. really, you know, quite it makes it very challenging. Mm. Well, that's that's good. Thank you for for sharing that. That's no, good. No. Mm. Cool. So yeah, so I think. 
this comes to basically towards the, the end of our, our event. So I'm, I'm sharing on the screen. So our next event is a, a five, five side chat. So kind of a new format uh, on the topic um, data protection. Um, the topic itself sounds really dry, but I would say it's, it's an important one and especially for, for BAs because it's, um, it's, it's an important one like for, for all organizations. And it's about how we can do data protection in a pragmatic way. So, um, so it's, it's going to be a kind of an interesting one. So I would highly recommend you, you, you come when, and also register for, for the event when the, the advertisement is on. And we, we, we are thinking of running the next Arts and Soft as well. Uh, we will think of the topic of focus for, for this event. So, but if, if you have anything in mind, let us know. Otherwise we'll just go through the, the list uh, based on the, the survey. And yeah, and do get involved. Um, let us know if you want to be um, hosting events, organizing things, or you, if you think of anything about growing the community, we, we always kind of welcome the thoughts. And as you can see, kind of Ellen and I, we're trying to do more, but with kind of very limited capacity. So we, we do need your, your help and to, just to, to grow our community together. So yeah, so last thing, just spread the words, follow us, and and keep sharing that's good thank you very much all and we'll stay behind for for a bit um if anyone would like to have a chat but yeah but otherwise enjoy your evening and uh, thank you again daniel oh, very thank, good. You for having me. thank you danny very kind of you to have me <laughs> cheers